have two gentlemen that have been willing to come and share their stories and uh, collect collections of thoughts, their memories of the town of Plymouth. So I would like to welcome Wilbur Coffey on my immediate left and Bill Noyes. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming in. This is one of our latest initiatives called the Memories of Plymouth, whereby we've been inviting people over the last several months to come in and share the stories. It allows us to know what a wonderful place Plymouth is to live. We have a series of questions we'd like to ask you today. The first few are because the audience may never have heard of you. I cannot believe that one. Or some people know of you. No. And of course, we have a group of people that know you very well. But for those few that um, may not know very much about you, I have the following questions. Please state your formal name. Wilbur Coffey. No middle name, Wilbur? Earl. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> William E. Noyce, nicknamed Bill. Bill, Bill. Noyce. E go. is Edward. Edwin. And where were you born? I was born in Plymouth, the old hospital. Okay. We call that Livermore for some folks that are listening yeah. today. Sure. I was born in Burlington, Vermont by accident. Mother was uh, visiting her family and I decided to make an appearance early. <laughs> and what is early? What year would that have been? 39. And that makes you? 78 now. All right. And Wilbur? I was born in 40. And that makes you? 77. 77. Thank you. Sounds good. <laughs> Next question. Uh, let's see. Would you mind uh, sharing who your parents were? And, and Wilbur, maybe where you lived. Charlotte and Earl Coffey, and I lived on most of the time on Russell Street. I lived a few years in on Pleasant Street, and we moved down the hill to Russell Street. And when you say Russell, for me, that means Russell and Pleasant. Where you, they you, come together, absolutely. right on the corner. All right, great, great. Uh, yeah, the question, <laughs> oh, wait, uh, where did you live? Oh, uh, okay. Parker Street. Mm -hmm. uh, Parker Street uh, was there until, uh, we lived there until 52, and then we moved on Russell Street in 52. Uh, we call that moving into town. Parker Street, moving into town. Because that was all dirt, Parker okay. Street, Good. and people just didn't travel. You know, uh, you, you walked, mm -hmm. and we thought we were in the big city. <laughs> Thank you for that. Did you both have your education in Plymouth before I move forward? Yes. 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 All right. Would you mind spending a minute or two, just um, your memories, chatting about maybe the names of the teachers that you can recall um, at either level, any level, elementary when you were in junior high school or uh, secondary high school? Can you recall any of those teachers, and maybe why? Uh, maybe why? Uh, yes, uh, Lulu Hoyt. She was fourth grade and fifth grade teacher, mm -hmm. and she took a real interest in the students. If you had a problem, she would work with you, stay after school with you, and Miss Spitzner in junior high. She was my fifth grade teacher, if I remember correctly. <laughs> so she made me gone from seventh and eighth. Yeah. And her down. favorite saying was, you're a dumb cough dumber. <laughs> that meant dumb in the head. <laughs> no, comment. <laughs> no comment. She was a good teacher. Uh, she was strict. She was yes, strict. Yes, and she'd tell you, I'm going to throw you out the window. <laughs> and she probably could. <laughs> <laughs> Wilbur? Mrs. Spitzner was the one that really got to me in, in grade school, and uh, she's a good teacher, but I can always remember she used to come out and play basketball and football with us. At, wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. Wow. She was, Interesting. She Interesting. was. Hmm. Did, did, in high school, did you, were you involved in any extracurricular activities? It could have been sports. It could have been uh, the yearbook. I played one year of football. And then there was other activities, and the one I took up 
for one session was riflery. We would go from the high school down to the police station, do target shooting, and you could bring your rifle to school and be left off in the principal's office. And you picked it up at the end of uh, the day, which unheard of today. Absolutely. Wilbur? Uh, I have nothing on that. You, did you play sport? I did play sports. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, <laughs> played mm -hmm. a little basketball mm -hmm. from, I don't know, fifth grade up. All right, all right. And we used to have a basketball court in my back door yard. And my brother was about six years older than I, so when he played, and all the kids from his age played, if they only had nine, well, I happened to be the tenth person, and I got a chance mm. to play. Oh, that's neat. Can either of you remember the coaches? Uh, Bernard Smith taught uh, what was uh, Little League basketball, was it? Is that yeah. Uh, well, you played with Bernard, didn't you? Yes, I did. And uh, he was a, a great coach with the kids. He took a, an interest. That's neat. That's neat. How about basketball? Did you have... I played basketball for that, and then I went into high school, and I had can't remember the coach the first two years. The last year, two years, I had Wilbur Hickson, which was from uh, BB River, and he went through Plymouth State, and he was one good coach. Mm -hmm. And would you tell me why he was one good coach? Well, we ended up to be in the playoffs my senior year. Uh, we lost in the quarterfinals, but we went undefeated that year. Well, wow. well. Wow. Uh, the coach, when we went in, I think was uh, Frigno, and he left, and then Maycutt yes. came in yeah. as uh, coach, and Wilbur Hickson, I think, assisted, was it? Yeah. Initially. And then I played football one year in my senior year, and that was Wilbur Hickson was the coach then, too. All right. Thank you. Uh, relative to business, the jobs that you have had over time, would you mind sharing what you've done? Well, uh, I put in 42 years with the former IPC, which, which was International Packings Corporation, which was bought out by Frudenberg out of Weinheim, Germany. Uh, I served time, that sounds peculiar to say, what I mean by time <laughs> is apprenticeship. I served three years. and obtained my journeyman's papers from the state to be a full-fledged toolmaker, uh, uh, machinist, and whatnot. I had various other part-time jobs with the railroad, worked with uh, four different farmers in the area, uh, haying, cutting wood, anything uh, to make a dollar. A dollar. Can you remember how much money you actually made per hour for some of your early jobs? Cutting early wood jobs. for Ken Janis, Harold Glover, and Elma Glover. I got $4 a cord, and that is without a chainsaw. That was with an axe and buck saw. And had a 1930 Model A Ford to haul the wood out in the wintertime during school vacation. Christmas vacation. Uh, I worked for the First National Lugging Groceries. That was 70 cents an hour. Of course, gasoline, you could buy at Peck's gas station for 25 cents a gallon. Do you remember that? Yep. Where, where was Peck's located? Top of Shank Mill Hill or Peg Mill Hill, depend on which where you want to go. All right, all right, interesting. Wilbur? Yeah, I worked for Grossman's when I was in grade school. I worked for... We need to stop you. Where's Grossman's, please, for the audience? It's across the river in Holdness. Mm -hmm. And just as you get on the other side, you take a right, sharp right. Good, good, thank you. And I worked at uh, Harvey's Gas Station, which is where the dentist shop is now. 
And I worked at the bowling alley in the railroad station for a few years. Excuse yes. me, want to share that with the audience a little bit? Well, the biggest <laughs> thing that I can remember about that was, oh. Not getting hit. No, yes. Did you, did and you, it was by... Louis Francisco? No. Who had the restaurant? Lassad? Blake. Blake? Warren Blake. Mm -hmm. Very little in stature, but Mr. Man, you wanted to be three alleys away from where it was because this guy could bowl. Wow. And what was your position? What job did you do in the bowl, at the bowling alley? That setting pins because we did not have automatics. All right. And was that on the first floor? Was there a sub floor? No, that was on the main floor. There's only floor. one floor anyway, right? Correct. Uh, yeah. It's right where uh, the senior center home, uh, holds their uh, meetings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They had, mm -hmm. what, about four alleys. Then I worked for Waterville Valley for a few years when they were building the new area. 60s. And then I went to Pitney Bowes and I worked for them for 25 years. Mm -hmm. The same question that I had uh, for Bill. Can you remember what you got paid per hour with any of these early jobs? At, at Waterville, if I remember right, it was a government job when they first did it. And we got fairly good pay, which was six, seven dollars an hour. And I was driving a Bombardier, and that was good money back then. But it only lasted while they were building the area, because I worked for the ski area one more year afterwards, and it just went back to regular pay, which was maybe four. Hmm. Uh, so it sounds like during both of your childhoods, um, you had several jobs. Yes, in the railroad, I cleaned passenger cars. Because the railroad passenger service lasted uh, a couple of years after the rails were pulled from Plymouth to Woodsville. So passenger cars would come in and they'd turn them and I'd turn the seats, sweep the seats, uh, cars out, fill up the water coolers, very sanitary. We'd get ice, slide it down the floor where a thousand people walk down, take a screwdriver, break up the ice. With your hands, throw it in the water cooler, get a pail, never wash a pail out, fill up the water cooler, and you had those little Dixie envelope cups. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, 25 cents a car I got for cleaning. 25 cents a car. Can you put an era to it? That would be uh, 56, 56, 57. And when did the railroads stop carrying passengers? Right at that same time. General Middle 50s. time frame. But the freights ran daily from Concord to Lincoln, though, so there's still trains going through. Perfect. Thank you. The place that we're setting in right now was a Pisa state. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Charlotte Pisa. The Pease. lawn that was out here to my right, I used to mow for $3 a time for how peas by hand. I remember that. And let me tell you, there was some steep bank out there at the end. <laughs> yes, that was with a hand mm. push mower. Oh, yes. Mm. That's all we had then. Well, the, the next question goes right along with what you just shared. I, I, I'm asking you, if you had, in, during the years that you lived here, do you have certain memories or reflections that you still have as a child, as a child here, growing up in Plymouth. And that's one of them, mowing the lawn here. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. I mean, was, was it a fun place to live? Were there best friends that you had, that you played with? What did you do? Well, on Parker Street, there was nobody around. So you kind of made your own uh, memories. And I can recall... Uh, it was John Pike, his cow got out, running, I can see it now. I was probably five, five years old, cow running down the street. A couple minutes later, John Pike and his dump cat and horse loses control of the horse and dump cat and lands in the brook. Well, this would be wartime because Dad was gone. The only thing happened, he broke his leg, and Mother took this John Pike to the hospital for his broken leg. 
the old hospital. But I can see that just this plain, that memory. And he was standing up in his dump cart, just beating that horse. I thought he was doing 90 miles an hour. And I remember standing there on the porch when the horse and dump cart went rolling by. That's interesting. Wilbur, anything fun that you can remember that stayed with you after all these decades? Well, I, I thought Plymouth was a great place to live because in the summers I used to go to my aunt's in Manchester so I could go to the Y. But the action down there was four times what Plymouth had, and I was happy to get home. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a series of memories that I'd like you to talk about so we can jump back and forth. Do you have memories of uh, any unusual type of weather during your early years, hurricanes, floods? Did you attend the fair? We know that the Plymouth Fair was the longest, the oldest fair in the state, and as many fairs, we see them going by the wayside now. Every year we see another fair that's not going to be opening up. So weather, fairs, fires perhaps? Uh, yes, this could be kind of long-winded. Oh, I'll shut you off. <laughs> okay, uh, fairs. They used to bring horses in by rail and unload them down the railroad station. Wild horses, at least they were wild when they got here, bring them up to the fair to be auctioned off. Uh, the railroad used to run a fair train to cart people from the railroad station to the fair and back, continuous running. It was like a taxi service. Weather, uh, I'm going to say this would be about 1946. Dad was home from the Navy. Uh, awful snowstorm, and the town had an Alice Chalmers bulldozer, V plow, and double side wings. They could not plow the snow up Thurlow Street. They had the kitty corner to the north side of uh, Miss Kennison Driveway, cut right across a field which is grown up with vegetation and houses to the brook on Parker Street. They just couldn't. It drifted so. They had the snow piled up so high when they finally did get a hole through, you could stand on the bank and touch a power line. And I couldn't find the picture of it. The other storm would be on Texas Road, down in the hollow where Norma Blank has his tree farm, and where Sergeant Schoolhouse is. That would be 1951-52. That was closed for one week. I believe the town of Plymouth had to get the state to come in to open it up. The snow was so deep and drifted in. Because, well, your dad, he drove dump truck plows in their ton and a half trucks. You, anything major, you couldn't and it, the wind would just blow. Hmm. Reason being, everything was so much more open then. It, the wind would just blow and drip, like coming across Miss Keniston's field. Because on Parker Street, I could look out of my bedroom window, look right down, see a town of Plymouth, over the Grossman's, the railroad yard, the engine house, and whatnot. Now it's a jungle. Hmm. So there was no wind breaks. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Wilbur, do you have anything? Remember all the floods and the ice jams, and I can remember driving cars across the river from the Chevy garage in about two and a half feet of water. Oh, what era would that decade would that have been in? It had to be in the 50s. 50s. Yeah, when I was in high school, and we got no pay for it at all, no recognition for it. What do you mean you got no pay? What would you have had to do? Well, you <laughs> going across and walking out there to the Chevy garage That's where you were and working. getting in cars and bringing mm -hmm. them back, but they never give us any money for doing any, no recognition at all. I'll shake your hand for doing <laughs> it. <laughs> <laughs> and the hmm. fires, the Congregational Church, I think it was the first one there because I had a scanner and I heard it. Hmm. And I told the wife, I says, I'm going to the fire it's in the church. And this was around 1984? Yeah, I and so. I uh, 
I went down over the hill, and I think I was the first one there. The cops' cars were just coming back from wherever they'd been. I think I was the first one there. That was a bad fire. That was a bad fire. Did, do we know if anything uh, made it through that fire? The bell, didn't it? Yeah. Which was never really right afterwards. Uh -huh. Am I yeah. mistaken? That's no. the only thing I think that was left, really, because it was bad. Wow. And that's wow. because, it, wasn't it final sighted at that time? I don't recall. And I could mm. remember seeing the vinyl just curl up and go up the building, and now I know why firemen don't like vinyl-sided houses. Wow. Uh, I'm going to jump backwards, if I can, and talk about the service. Were you gentlemen in the service? If so, which one and when? I was in the service from sometime in 59, I would say it would no, sometime in 60, I would say it would be in August. I joined, uh, Tommy Tompkins and I had enlisted when we first got out of high school that year. And come August, we hadn't heard a thing. And one day we were riding around. And I said, let's go to Laconia and join. And we did. So I was in this army for three years. And in basic uh, training? Fort where Dix. Was Fort Dix. Yep. And then when you, were you stationed someplace else after that time? No, I flew right to Germany, down to Italy, and I was in Naples at the NATO base there for two and a half years. I'd, I'd like you to talk a little bit. You had shared that during that time you played a little bit of basketball. That's about all I did. <laughs> I hate to say it, but that's what I did <laughs> over there uh, about seven, seven and a half months a year. I uh, got there the day before Christmas, if I remember. We got there, and the thing I always remember about it is uh, we couldn't go see the head of the department when we got there, so we were going in Monday, and when we got there Friday night, the guys said, uh, you guys play hoop? And there was a kid from Nevada with me, and we said, yeah. And he says, well, have you got your stuff? We says, no, our bags haven't even come with us yet. And he says, well, we'll find you some sneakers. So we both went over and played. <clears throat> Come on, demand the old man. We we're in to see the old man, what we call the old man, which is the head of the base. And he went through all this procedure with us. And then he says, you guys play hoop? We says, yeah. He says, that's too bad. He says, uh, we had tryouts last night. We said, we know. We're on the team. And he was unreal mad because now he had to put us in different places because we were going to be playing basketball. Now when you played basketball you were moving from place to place? We played all over Europe. I can remember playing in uh, Spain, a lot in upper uh, Italy, in Germany and that. Uh, come, oh, it must have been in uh, the last of January. This was a base, which was a NATO base, so we had all the troops there, and we had tryouts to make the all-star team. I made the all-star team, and after that, we just traveled. Traveled. I sold all my leave back to the Army after I got out because I didn't need to take any leave. I was traveling all over. Wow. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, Bill, you have an interesting story about the service. I'm still waiting. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, would you explain that a little bit? Well, of course, when you turned 18, you had to sign up for the draft. Local Board 5 out of uh, Lebanon. And I, I was classified A1. Tops, you could be drafted. So, after I got out of high school, I got a notice. You're going to be drafted. Show up at local board five. We did. Took the train, a whole bunch of us, two car loads. Went down to Manchester, stayed overnight at the Cadillac Hotel. Long story short, did physical. Sergeant asked me, he said, do you want to go in the service? I said, I don't care. He says, okay, 28 days, be ready. I said, okay, A1. So, I'm waiting, waiting. I get notices. What are you doing? Tell them I'm waiting to go. A1. This went on for four or five years. <laughs> Got married, had a couple of kids, still A1, ready to go. So, I tell people I'm 
still, still waiting. waiting. <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting story. Uh, major changes in town. You've been here for decades. Is there a change or two that has um, that you can recall that you'd like to share with the audience? Bill, let's start with you. Uh, I think West Plymouth. Uh, and Wilbur, you remember the old road going through yeah. West Plymouth? And what we call the new road now, they put in, I guess, in the early 50s, 51, 2, 3. And I had Model A Ford. And I'd figure, now that Model A Ford was a 1930. It'd be really running good heading towards West Plymouth bucking a west wind if I get 35 miles an hour out of it right to the floor she was percolating good but coming back was box on four wheels I could sail across but how it's grown up uh, you had the Spencer farm uh, the Fletcher farm uh, Clarence Flanders who was known as Mule Skinner out there mowing with his horse, Roby farm. Uh, all of that was all agricultural, all farmland. I think to me, looking at the rural aspect, that's the, one of the big changes outside of Main Street. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Wilbur? Probably get in trouble for this, but the main, main thing was the college. Mm -hmm. It just grew too big. I can remember all the houses that were turned into condos and student living. Uh, at one time we had a lot of trouble between high school kids and college kids. Mm -hmm. And I can always remember the house down on Russell Street that uh, the porch was blown off the back of the house one night. and. Uh, can you put a, a year, a decade to that, approximately? Well, it had to be, it was, uh, maybe not, maybe it was in the 60s. It, it, it could was, be, I, I remember it, mm. but I couldn't put a, a, a date to it. Uh. Good. Yeah, mm. I can't either. All right. But you saw that, you were there, or you I heard, heard it? it. <laughs> you heard it, you heard it, interesting. So, and I heard it the next morning, that's what had happened. Mm -hmm. And they, I don't know if they ever found out what it was. It, at least no one in town had any information on it. Yeah, a great mystery, a great yeah. mystery. On fires, there was a, a fire that hasn't been brought up. Uh, it was the old engine house, railroad engine house, which I have a picture of here. The, the massive construction you know, timbers, uh, 25, 30 feet long, 16 inch by 16 inch timbers. Railroad is on decline. And they pushed the doors in, knocked the windows out and touched it. They, I don't think fire department even came down. I was standing on a loading platform down by Chase Grain, which incorporated the Boston Main Freight House. What a massive fire with all the barrels of engine oil, hundreds of gallons of oil, and they just torched it. You had flames, maybe I'm exaggerating, uh, uh, 50, 75 feet in the air, instead of dismantling it, taking those nice big, I was told uh, by some of the section foremen, old growth spruce. They would be 25, 30 feet long, 16 inch by 16 inch. Just think they could have been resawed and sold, but just destroyed. But the fire was just humongous. Then the fire at the end of World War II. That was so hot. I can I can remember standing there with mother. Dad hadn't got home yet that the glass on Newberry's was hot. Yes, it, being a kid, it seemed like the pile was 20 feet high, just boards and anything that would burn at the north end of the common. Uh, 
So this was intentional. It was a bonfire. Oh, yes. To yes. celebrate the end of World War II. Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. And, and so for some folks, uh, they don't know where Newberry's, J.J. Newberry's 5 and 10 cent stores. So it's opposite the town hall. Correct. Right at the north end of the common where that little flowered uh, diamond is. Uh, a little okay. rotary. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I I just can't really describe, but I thought it was big. From and, a child's perspective? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's neat. And I, I know you could stand there in front of Newberry's and feel the heat. That, that's a fun story. Thank you for sharing that. Was there a person in your lifetime here, could have been somebody outside, but perhaps somebody in the town of Plymouth, a person that really influenced you as a child or as you were growing up? could be a parent, it could be a, a teacher, but, and, and you can pass on this. But if there was somebody that really influenced you, Wilbur? My dad was a big influence, of course, and he could do things that uh, most people couldn't do. He, he was a logger back in his days when he was in Canada, but uh, he used to do push-ups, and I just couldn't believe it, but I learned how to do them after a while. Your feet and your hands used to come off the ground every time you come up, and they'd clap. Now, I've seen lots of guys do it with just their hands, but boy, when you bring your feet off, you got to be together doing that. <laughs> is this a picture of your father? That's a picture of my dad. Mm -hmm. And in where his is garden. he? Oh, here we go. In his garden. Where yep. is he? Where's this located? This is on Russell Street. Russell Street. He always had a garden. You bought veggies from him, so or your folks did, so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. everyone did. Just and so the audience knows, I'm living here. He he's living at the opposite corner. And Correct. this is the clock, yeah, which was the first paper, I guess, that the college put out. Oh, is that right? So that's now I don't know if there was others, but that's the first paper. We'll it was out that. for the public, I believe. So the date on this is May 6, 1975, a Tuesday. It's a student newspaper of Plymouth State College of the University of New Hampshire. And they continue to put out a clock. They continue to put out a clock. Do they? Yes, yeah. they do. Okay. Yes, they do. Yeah. And that's your dad. And I can't tell you exactly when it started, but the college kids always used to stop and talk to him. <laughs> that's neat. Your that's dad beautiful. always had a big garden. Yes, he did. Yeah. Oh, yes. I remember it. I can and remember everybody it. had gardens, whether it be... Yep. A flower box. I mean, everybody had a tomato patch and a few string beans. <laughs> we'll, we'll pose the same question for you. Well, I think mother was because dad was gone. The only, well, she was the one who took care of the house and so on and so forth because most of the men were gone, World War II. And she was, I think, uh, my mentor. And then I think this Elma Glover that I bought the farm from 50 odd years ago, kind of strange turnabout, real Yankee farmer, one of the fellows I worked with, to work hard, do the best you can, and use people fair and square. And same with his brother. They were twins, but they didn't look any more alike. He was the same way. Uh, and then this George Snyder, he was real professional railroad engineer. And he made it a point, you do the best you can and know your job. Don't take anything from anybody. If you're in charge, you're in charge. No mm -hmm. ifs, ands, or buts. And a lot of people could not get a, a work with him. But I got along great with him. I wanted to hire out the railroad after I got out of high school. He gave me a lot of pointers. And he was a mentor in so far as work ethics and set a goal. Mm -hmm. Sad thing. He got killed two weeks before he retired. Mm. Mm. And I, I think that's yeah. all I have to say. Yeah. On. yeah. Um, I'm going to jump backwards if I uh, can a little bit. Thinking years, decades ago, did you have a best friend in school? A best friend? I had a couple. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Bill was down the street, but I had Earl Williams mm. 
and Dale Keniston. Dale Keniston. And Dale Keniston's father was the postmaster at the post office and also run the theater back then. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say the same thing because Earl Williams uh, lived in between us. Yep. Right. And at one time, right across from you. He and lived then in the Keniston house right across from me. They were hmm. Taylors. Yes. Uh, that was Mac Keniston's father. Okay. Yep. And then they moved on to Russell Street just around the corner. Yep. Yes. Because she used to sell birds yes. and fish. <laughs> I can remember that. Oh, yes. He lives in Lincoln still. I haven't seen him in years. I haven't. Mm. But I know he lives up there. I'm going to take you back again, and I'm going to talk about foods. Oh, my gosh. Is there a food that you can remember from your childhood? It might come from a restaurant that we had in town. It might be something that a family member prepared, something you always wanted and couldn't get. Was there something that jumps out? Yes. Mother's homemade baked beans. <laughs> Every Saturday night was baked beans and hot dogs. It wasn't Saturday night unless you had baked beans. And then her pea soup. Put your spoon in it and it stands up with Johnny cake or cornbread. Now, you might say I'm being a little peculiar. I've been out deer hunting. Rainy night, I came home. We hadn't been married too long. Wife says to me, I got a good supper for you. I got steak, mashed potato, and peas. I said, what do you mean? I said, you know this is bean night. I'm not having steak Whoa. and mashed potato Whoa. on Saturday night. And she got irritated with me. Wonder why. <laughs> I said, fix it for me for breakfast Sunday morning. But Saturday night is beans. No ifs, ands, or buts. There is no smile on your face right oh, now. Oh, you best believe it. <laughs> Wilbur? I can always remember the beans and hot dogs Saturday night. <gasps> oh, my gosh. I can always remember my father when he had his garden, the corn. He would always, they would, my mother would always start the water boiling before he picked it. Because when he picked it, he wanted it to go in instantly. And it was the best con I ever had. <laughs> now, as far as restaurants in town, Fausti's, there was nothing else. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was a Potter's restaurant that we used to come down from high school now and then and get something to eat. Yeah. I used to go in Newberry's because my mother run the counter in there for years. Mm -hmm. And uh, But Fausti's was the place to go. Yes. And I, mm -hmm. I can always remember that for the town employees, and I think the police too, which were town employees, he always used to give them coffee at night and nice. no charges. Nice. So this and he was open all night, I believe, when back you for a while. When you say he, there were two brothers that I yes. can remember. Yes, Di, Minnie Kell, and Fausti. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. This kind of connects to the next one. Was there a favorite hangout for you as uh, young kids, youngsters? Fausties. <laughs> I'm going to say same. Fausties. Mm -hmm. Everyone went in there. After a ball game, I mean, it was just mud with all the kids from the well, game. You had teachers clam bar at the end. Well, yes, oh, you great. did have teachers clam bar, and that was run by a couple of teachers. Uh, George Zulius. Bruce Zulia Ryan. Bruce Ryan and Zulius. Here we go. Mr. Go. Zulius. But which talk was about uh, uh, Fausties, a comical thing. And we mentioned this here, you and I. Uh, I can't tell you which police officer it was. Jack, uh, Jack, the uh, back of the police cruiser up. So one wheel is off the ground. A couple of kids got out there, started peeling their tires. Officer comes tearing out, jumps in his car, puts in gear. He's not going anywhere. He's just spinning. <laughs> 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 right there in front of Fausties. And then skiing at the old Waterville Valley, which was... Snows Mountain. Yes. Snows Mountain. Yes, as mm -hmm. a kid. I wasn't a good skier, but we used to go up there. 
Hmm. Have a good time. Nice. Did either of you ski at Frontenac or Tenney Mountain? I skied at Frontenac, I sure, and heck didn't go down. I mean, at uh, Tenney Mountain, I didn't. I skied there. I skied yeah. at Frontenac, but you know there is a ski area on the back side of that. You have to tell me it begins with yes. a W. Wendy's. 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 That close. was made for certain people, I think. That was more. <laughs> that was oh, down. Steep. steep. Knowles and some of those guys used to ski that, right. which right. were very good skiers. Joe, Joe Knowles, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, Parkett. There was a Parkett. Oh, team. yeah, Sonny. I talked to Sonny. He called me about a month ago. We talked for an hour huh. about skiing. And he was in the Army, or the Air Force. Yes, he was. And he skied on the ski team, I think, uh, yep. in the Olympics. Yep. What was his name? Uh, Sonny Parkett. Yep. His Sonny real name was Morris. Now, Morris. you might have known his father. Oh, Morris? Oh, yeah, sure. And I worked for Morris. His English wasn't too good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I learned a lot of French from him. <laughs> How about memories of companies, industries that you can remember maybe coming into Plymouth and maybe at the same time some that left? Do you have any memories of that? Businesses, industries that have come to Plymouth, downtown, downtown stores that have come and gone perhaps? The Adams's market, mm -hmm. when they built the new uh, Pemi Bank, uh, Church, of course. The Ford Garage. Where, where was the Ford Garage located? It's still there. It's a, what, a dry cleaning and... Uh, oh, absolutely. So it's a combination. It's got several yeah. businesses. Yeah, that one's realty just moved out of that. Mm -hmm. And when I, my father worked there, and I can always remember the cars when they used to bring them in. They used to bring them in all covered. And they'd take them and they could put them on the roof, that little road on the side. They yeah. could go up on the roof and pack them until the day that they showed them. Mm -hmm. And they used to do that all the time. Yeah. Uh, the Pemi House, do you remember that? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. And Location. Russell Field. Mm -hmm. What happened on Russell Field, which is now located, what's on Russell Field today? Is the college, right? Right. And Absolutely. Russell House. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. but it used to be a field that we could come up from the back of uh, Russell Street up onto the field, and there used to be skating there during the winter, and they used to have professional skaters in from someplace, and I don't know who put it on, but they used to have shows up there quite a few years. Oh, I wasn't aware of that. But we used to skate there a lot. Uh, my coach kind of used to frown on it when we play basketball. But I, well, because of where you and I lived, we just had to walk a few... We walked through it every day, go to school. Absolutely, yes. and we could ice skate during the winter. Yes, yeah. and we used to play softball up there during the summer. Uh, and the college used it as a facility, too, yes. for athletics. Now, when I was in high school, my first two years, Plymouth State College played in our gym, in the Silver uh, Spear Gym. They played in their, their college games for the first two years. And then they built Silver Hall. Very good. Well, a uh, new business was uh, Larry Boschman. He started Microsonic Machine Shop, and that's where I got started in machine shop trade. Top of Shank Mill Hill, or Peg Mill Hill, right next to Peck's gas station. Uh, then... You see, that would be about 1960, 59 or 60. Then uh, Sprague Electric came in, uh, which is there, well, that changed to what, Burndy, was it? Yeah. But Microsonic uh, burned, I think, in 62, I believe, because we were living the apartment house right next to the south side of Peck's gas station. It was a Saturday night in the winter, and I can remember that burning on a Saturday night. So that come and gone. Spregs and Burndy have come and gone. Burndy always a hitchner. 
Hechna. They spread was first, yeah. and in 59 and 60, starting out, I got 90 cents an hour in the machine shop. And before I left to uh, serve my time for apprenticeship, I got up to a dollar. But when I got the apprenticeship, boy, I was making good money, a dollar thirty. And top rate was two fifty, and anybody making a hundred bucks a week had a position back then, full time job. <laughs> Just to go back a little bit, when I went in the service, I can remember my first six months of pay was sixty seven dollars a month. But of course all your your clothing, all your medical, all your food and a place to sleep was all part of it, but that's what the pay started off at. Uh, uh, I'm not denying, uh, I think you're <laughs> right, because I think Dad, with Mother at home, was uh, like $50 a month. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And that was to buy your food and pay your rent. Amazing, amazing. Gentlemen, I asked you if you would be willing to share an artifact with us today, if you had one. Bill, do you have one that you'd like to share with the audience? Well, this uh, top here on the table here, mm -hmm. this was my grandfather's buffalo robe. Uh, he got that out in the Dakotas. He left home when he was 15. His mother had passed away. And he didn't get along with his new stepmother, so he left home at 15, go to the Dakotas to pick buffalo bones. He had his own team and wagon, and he picked this buffalo robe up. Well, here about five, six years ago, I had this authenticated by uh, the Sioux. Uh, the Lakota Sioux, and they said this was late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, grandfather was out there in 1900, and I said, how do you base this? The two Sioux uh, men that uh, authenticated this, they said, by the stitching and the way it's tanned. Now, it didn't mean anything to me on how it's tanned, but uh, a certain way, the way the Sioux sewed. Now, I can't tell you what that is, but they said, yes, that is very old and in excellent condition, this small buffalo hide. So did Grandfather ever use it when he was out in the Dakotas? I don't know, but he hung on to it, and I've obtained this now. Interesting, interesting. I think it's the first time I ever touched a buffalo skin. <laughs> don't get fleas. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> uh, can you, too, remember um, any upheavals during your time in Plymouth? It could be something happening at the local level, state level, national level. Mm, not really. The only thing is I think you're always on alert for enemy planes and there was a CAP, the Civilian Air Patrol, and there was a schoolhouse right at the top of Ward Hill which is gone now, it's a vacant lot. It was 24 hour watch and you reported anything for a plane that was flying. That's, well, was Cold War days. And didn't Tom Goulart head that up? Yes, he did. And Tom Goulart was who? He was shop teacher. Uh, Plymouth High School. Yes. If he has since passed away, what, about three, 
four years ago? I think so. And he headed CAP. And it was 24-hour man. And Steve Dennis and I would go up there for, I think it was, what, two, three hours at a time? Did you ever do that? No. I can remember my father having a nightstick and a hat that said that on the top of it. Yes. Wow. And I can remember him going out at night and saying, I've got to man the tower tonight. So that's, he would go. That's right. We didn't have a, a hard hat or a stick. Well, of course, we were... Yeah, we, you were in high school. Yes. Hmm. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other memories that you would like to share with the audience today? Yeah, I'd like to mention that the Hatch Dairy, the home that the Hatches lived in, uh, my wife and I moved it in the 60s up to Old Town Road, which is just up the street. You literally lifted it up? It was taken up, and I can always remember the guy out of Tilton did it. And uh, when we went in the house, when we went in the house, I, he says, you want the fireplaces? And I says, if we can. And he says, well, let's put a mark on the side of them in the, the sheetrock in the fireplace. And he moved the house up there. They set it way up on blocks so that they could build a foundation. And then they dropped it. And the day we went in, he says, let's go look at those marks. They're right on the button. Wow. Wow. So that's where the Hatch House is now. Hmm. And still there. That's beautiful. Nice one. I think, of course, I've always leaned towards agriculture. There was 30, 28 to 32 farms in the town of Plymouth. You had worth more feed for the farmers. Oh, yeah. uh, Merrimack farmers, Park and Pollard, all down the railroad station. And a real producing farm today, you've got only one, Perkins Farm. Now, when I say 28 to 32 farms, uh, they weren't all taking milk to the dairy. They might have three to eight cows like this Elmer Glover farm that I bought out. He did. He had eight cows, and he could make a living. And... I later had a half a dozen beef critters there in that pasture. Hmm. You could make a, a living, you wouldn't get rich, but how things have changed, non-agricultural and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And wood cutting for the farmers was a big thing, extra income in the winter time. And they loaded pulp wood down with the skating rink, uh, skateboard rink is. They had two ramps for trucks to load pulp cars. Hmm. Hmm. Thank you. We're, we're getting close, uh, but I would like to ask another question if I could. If you were to share something with future generations, if we had a group of young folks here, what advice or information might, might you share with them that you think is important? If you're a young person or an old person, do it now if you want to, because you never know. Relative to your health, maybe. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I fully agree, uh, but set a goal, a destiny, work hard, do your best, be fair, because tomorrow is today, and today is yesterday, and you can never get that back, because time is a thief. Tell me that one more time. I'm listening again. <laughs> Tomorrow is today. Today is yesterday. And time is a thief. And you'll never get it back. Mm. But be fair and square the best you can. But have a goal set. Set high so you fall a little short. You've got something to fall back on. Mm. Thank and you young for your people wisdom. have such an opportunity today. They aren't working in the woods Christmas vacation for four dollars a cord, knee deep in snow. Hmm. Thank you, that's some wisdom. 
Wilbur, want to share something else? Before yeah, Bill I and I down? were talking about it a few minutes ago about mm -hmm. a house that is next to the theater now. Ross Dietchman was in there for a while. I can't remember who else, but that came from School Street. And Bill and I can both remember it being moved right down the hill and around the corner. Yes. It was quite a thing. Mm -hmm. Of course, the Pemmy house was moved mm -hmm. from the railroad station up to where it is, part yeah. of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was combined with... A, a that was done by oxen, No, I didn't see that. That was done <laughs> before our day. They combined that with the university house, and that became the Pemmy Jawasset Inn. Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that other house was on School Street, right on the corner. Hmm. Yes, it's a nice house. Yes. Hmm. And they were afraid, go, before they got down where Northway Bank is, go around the corner, they might lose the house. Yeah. Because it was on tractor trailer. That's pretty unique for someone to watch a house being moved through yes. the town. Just to see it town. jacked up was something at mm -hmm. the time. Yeah. This was long before we moved our, our other house. Well, I do want to thank you. The hour has uh, gone by very, very quickly, so I appreciate your willingness to come in oh, I've and share that. your memories. Uh, yeah. We live in a pretty fast-paced world, and I think all of us need to sit down and, and chat with each other, find out what's really important. Uh, the community that we live in is one such. Our part in the community, uh, having the opportunity to give back. So again, I know your time is precious, but so pleased that you were willing to get together, especially the twosome chatting back and forth and me listening i enjoyed it immensely so to the audience today i think you have realized how important it is to share your memories if they're in picture form so continue every time we get together we see i say the same thing to you please continue to take pictures but more importantly print the pictures off and tag them on the back label them on the back if you would and then if there is a story that belongs write it up Put it on the wall. Somebody someday, somebody from your gener uh, your family might say or give you the question, what happened here? Why did Dad, why did Grandpa put this up on the wall? So until next time, thank you for joining us.